and thank you for having me back again this year. It's always a pleasure to be here. And um, today we're going to do some camping secrets, and we're going to run out of time. Um, we always do. It seems like 45 minutes is nearly enough. But I just want to preface this by saying that at the end of the at the end of the show, I got to get out of here fast because we got another speaker coming in. And so, um, if you have any questions or you want to chat, I'm going to be here most of the day. And I'm over in the books department there. So if you find the books, you'll see my table there. And come on over and chat uh, or whatever because I'll be here all day. And if you don't come by, I'll just get lonely, okay? So, um, okay, that, that's the first thing. The second thing is, you know, I taught eighth graders for a living for 34 years. And if you don't keep rolling with those kids, they, they eat you alive. So that's how I'm going to do it here. I'm going to just go, 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 go because I don't want you to get bored and leave, okay? So if you have any questions, you know, either just blur them out or raise your hand, do whatever you want to do. But otherwise, um, if there are like a major question that needs some, some time to answer uh, or it's more esoteric, maybe the best thing to do is just wait and come see me at the table and we'll sash it all out. Okay? Um, so uh, before, while we're still waiting to finish here, <clears throat> I want to share with you uh, some things that I, I learned this year and some products and stuff like that. I know it takes a little time away from the show, but I think it's kind of worth it because um, uh, there's just some fun things. So the first thing, these products have been out for a while. Excuse me. These products have been out for a while, but in, in case you're not familiar with them. How many of you are familiar with the Lucy one? How many of you are not? Oh. Well, this is one of the most amazing light sources that there is. You put this on your dashboard or whatever. You leave it out in the sun for about four or five hours, okay? Uh, and it charges. It's got 10 LED lights on the back, okay? And if I turn the light, this thing is so bright, and it blows up. You blow the thing up like this if you want to, okay? And so it makes a lantern, and so it's like this. Come on. What? Yeah, you got to squeeze the stem as you go. Okay, and then you can blow it up. Okay, now, now when you turn this thing on, this is one, unfortunately the lights are up. I'm just going to just hit this light here, just so you just, I don't know how these things work, so whatever happens is going to happen. Huh? You will? Okay, can you just drop them all for a second? Okay, now that's one. There, here's the bright one. That's not bad, is it? Go so now. I, this lights up your whole tent. Now I take two of these with me. Okay, I don't even use a headlamp anymore. I just get out if I, get out, I need some light. Now, just out in, if you're interested, you might be interested in a story about what you've probably seen a number of these products now that that create light and uh, charge your cell phone, right? Well, let me tell you what the real impetus is. In places like these, replaced persons camps and things, light is incredibly important. And they found like in Africa, <coughs> where families don't have light, what happens is, as soon as it gets dark, the father goes to the bar. And then he gets drunk, and then he comes home and he meets his family. But in, fa but in, in families that have light, he stays home. Now, I know this, it's hard for us to comprehend, but that's how important the light is. But anyway, these Lucy lights are pretty inexpensive. They're about twelve, thirteen dollars, something like that. I just think they're great. Okay, you never have to worry about batteries. So that's the other thing. Let me get the lights back on again, and I'll show you just a few other things that I've come across. Maybe. So, uh, um, all right, you know, we're always looking for good saws. This is the real pack saws. They're here at, here at the show. This is the best one that I've seen. This is amazing. Now, just watch this. Here. This is how it goes together. Okay? It comes down here like this. It comes around like that, and that's it. And it's got an all-tooth blade, meaning there are no rakers. Now, most of the blades you buy have rakers, which are little 
twin prong kind of cutesy looking things. Pe people love those. Uh, why, I don't know. They think they're really sexy or something. I don't know. But, but here's the thing. Rakers don't rake. rake uh, excuse me. Rakers don't cut. They rake. They rake the sawdust out of the curb. So if you are cutting green wood, okay, that has a lot of sap in it, it just clogs up the saw curb if you don't have some rakers in there. So they generally put one raker to about every four cutters. Okay? So that means that you only have four, you've lost 20, really 20% 20 of the, 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 the blade, blade length, all right? Now the deal is, rakers are fine if you're cutting green wood. You go to the Boundary Waters and you cut green wood, you're going to jail, boy. Okay? And if you go to Canada or Alaska on a canoe trip and you cut green wood, you're stupid because it doesn't burn. So the point is, for a wood saw, you don't need rakers. You only need cutters. So look for an all-cutter blade, like what you see here. Anyway, I think this is a, a really intelligently designed saw. And like I say, they're here at the show, and the, the, the saw is not easy to find in stores, in U.S. stores. It's a Canadian product. OK, great product. OK, now the next thing that I want to share with you is, uh, you know, there, there are all kinds of pillows on the market, these air pillows and things like that. I have so many pillows, I don't want to do them all. But you know, usually what I, what I like personally like the best, I like everything to do double duty on the trip. So I have a light down jacket that I always take on all my trips. I use it for a pillow, okay? And so usually, yeah, this is just a towel, okay? It gets folded over with a couple of snaps and it's sewn up the side. I just stuff my down jacket in there and that's my pillow. So now I have a pillow, I have a down jacket. Uh, but these guys sent me this, this is a new product, in fact, it's not even in stores. It's called the Mega Pill. It's by Exped, okay? I think Exped, if I think, is a Swiss company, if I'm not mistaken. <coughs> this thing is so comfortable, yeah, I'm almost reconsidering taking a pillow. <laughs> um, it's a, and it's an air pillow, but it's got some stuff in it. I don't know what, what, what it is, but it's so comfortable. Uh, but if you're a pillow person, check out the, the x Pen Mega Pillow. It's, I don't even think it's in the stores. Yet. So, all right. And uh, you, can, you can blow the thing up real hard if you want to, or you can deflate it way, way down if you want. Okay, so those are some of the new products. Um, there's a um, couple of other things. We'll get to that in just a minute. <coughs> um, earlier this year, I did a canoe trip on the Barrens River in Manitoba. I'll tell you more. I'll tell you more about that in a little bit. And it's a tough river. It's got a lot of rapids on it. I have this old Royal X canoe. I mean, this baby goes back to the 1980s. There's been a lot of trips on this, a lot of patches on this boat. And I hit a rock with this thing and sliced, uh, sliced, uh, sliced through the, uh, the Royal X and started leaking. And so we put ashore that evening and I was still going to my pack and I looked at my little repair kit out and I'm looking for my duct tape. I cannot find my duct tape. No duct tape. So I got five other guys on the trip and I say, who's got some duct tape? Nobody has any duct tape. Can you believe this? Six guys go on a canoe trip and no duct tape? So I got, how am I going to patch this boat? So I started looking in there and I had some of these, well, I'll show you. I had some of these magnet patches, okay? Okay. Whoops, let me back. Right here. Let me get the lights down again. I got it. I got it. All right, good. Thank you. Okay. And they, they make two kinds. That's perfect. Thank you. All right, they make two kinds of patches. They make a type A and a type B. This is what they look like. They come in here, about this size. They also come on a roll. All right, type A is for canvas, nylon, rubber, and plastic, and type B is vinyl and vinyl coated. Well, Rolex canoes are coated with vinyl, so I do the type B. And it has a little alcohol swab, so I clean off the spot, and I put this thing on there, and I say to myself, I don't think this is going to work. I mean, come on, nothing beats duct tape, right? <laughs> Okay, mix, long story short, paddle the rest of the entire river, no leaks, no problem. I get home now and decide to do a proper patch, which is Kevlar and then fiberglass over Kevlar epoxy. Okay. So I start trying to remove this patch. It will not come off. I try to lift the edge of it. 
you cannot lift it. I'm scraping and scraping. I cannot get this thing off. I'm actually starting to get a little ticked about it. I'm just like, I can't believe this stuff sticks like this. So finally, I said, the only answer is I got out the orbital sander and just sanded the thing off. Okay. Uh, so I bring this up because this is one whale of a product. Uh, and it's the best patch, it's, it's absolutely the best patch. I don't know if something just bonds into it. All right, a couple of other new, new products that I, <coughs> that I have um, uh, found. All right, now this is not a camping product, but I'm just in love with it. Have you heard of these BioLite stoves, right, that charge your cell phone and give you light? Okay, I got one of these for uh, uh, Christmas from a friend of mine, and uh, this is called the Base Cap. It's a big model. This is the one that they actually give out in displaced persons camps and things like that, so pe people will have something to cook on. All right, so now this thing here, um, uh, it's double-walled stainless steel. It's got a fan in it. It's got a light. It's got a light. It's got an side over here. It's got a thing you can charge your cell phone. Really, it's kind of interesting. Um, this is I'm cooking chicken on here. I cooked these three big pieces of chicken on one piece of wood, which was about, I would say, an inch and a quarter in diameter, and two tiny pieces of apple wood about the size of small chunks of coal. No smoke. Now, with due respect, I am a magnificent pizza maker. I make great pizza from scratch. It's uh, strictly running as high as my, like 500 degrees. If I could get it six or 700, I would probably run it at that. On a pizza stone, everything's total from scratch. When I made pizza, uh, the pizza on this is amazing. Now this was cooked, I, I made four pizzas like this, okay? And that was on, okay? That was on uh, uh, two pieces of, of, of wood. Each one of these pieces of wood was probably an inch and a quarter in diameter and uh, a couple of chunks of applewood. And it picks up that applewood uh, aroma and there's a top that goes on this thing, okay? And it's got a gauge that tells you what the temperature is. And there's no smoke. You can see it's cooking. It's running really good. There's not even any smoke coming, coming out of this thing. Um, I just love that I have this expensive Holland grill, and you know, I've had that for 20 some years. I, didn't, I think I'm just going to sell the grill. I don't use it anymore. I just love it. So, this is another product that I have found that is really, really great. Okay, um, all right, and here's another product. This is a product that we discovered about a year ago. It's called Simply Native uh, Quick Cooking Wild Rice Cereal. It's delicious. These people have. Uh, who don't actually, they live not too far, they live in the River Falls, Wisconsin, basically the same town I do. They discovered a way to pre cook wild rice. And so they come up with this cereal with this wild rice. It's, this is really delicious. And what I, I do, I, I mix it half and half with oatmeal. But if you're looking for a, a kind of a different, really tasty breakfast in the morning, uh, this, this is it. All right, now, with these thoughts in mind, I want to just share with you. Um, <clears throat> I just want to share with you a couple of quick things. Um, two things I learned this year, because you're always learning no matter what you do. The right, first thing I learned this year was don't be a smart ass. <laughs> and here's the story. We did this Barrens River in Manitoba. I always wanted to do this river. This has got a little bit of a spiky river, lots of waterfalls, and major rapids, things like that. It's pretty remote. It's in Manitoba. And I had Hap Wilson's trick guide on the river. Now, Hap Wilson's probably the supreme map maker in Canada for Canoe. And I took a look at it and I said, hey man, you know how many of these Canadian rivers I've done? You know? I don't need a stinking trip guide. So I folded the thing up and put it in my pack. So, first day of the trip, airplane sets us down, we're paddling along, about four hours into the trip, river splits. One over here goes over a huge major falls. That's a killer fall, I'm not going that. Okay, this one goes through a, 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 was a high class two drop. Uh, yeah, we could have some problems in there, but it looks like it's doable, okay? So we're looking for forage. We're looking around, we're looking around, we're looking around, probably looking for 10 or 15 minutes. It has to be right above this falls on the left. Couldn't find it. So I said, I forget it. I said, you know, this is a really remote river. It doesn't look like it's hardly a bad. I'm sure the people who come here are very experienced and they know they, 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 they run that rapid. Okay, but so we ran the rapid with one capsize, okay, we got everybody out okay, it was no problem. And then from that point on, for the rest of the day, it was 
every 10 or 15 minutes. Major falls, major rapid, major falls, major rapid, with trees going right up to the shoreline. No portages, no way around it, not even an animal trail. Fortunately, we had two, well, they were kids, they were young men, okay, with full frame saws and axes. So we made our own portages. At the end of the day, I think we did, we ended, I think, at 7 o'clock that night. I think we did two and a half miles. <laughs> so we're sitting around the fire, and I pull out, I said, I guess we better look at the trip guide. So we pull out the trip guide, and we look at it, and, oh, guess what? There's a portage after all. But it started way in that bay, way, another bay, way above to the falls. <coughs> and it bypassed this whole thing. <laughs> Don't be a smart aleck, I learned that. <clears throat> All right, the second thing I learned is one's perception of difficulty changes with age. <laughs> now, some of you may have my book, Boundary Waters Canoe Camp. And in that book, I recommend my favorite route, which is the Frost River. Okay? And it runs from Frost Lake to Little Saginaw Lake. It's very remote, not very many people do it. And there's a section of the river that the main river, you can follow the main river all the way to Little Saginaw. But it's really not for the faint of heart, okay? All right? Now, for, uh, for years and years and years, I took teenagers in aluminum canoes down that route, okay? And we would take them from Little Sag, uh, excuse me, from Frost Lake to Little Sag in one long day. It was one long day. Okay, this time, there was four guys over 65 in lightweight solo canoes, and it took us three and a half days. <laughs> and this is what... Oh, wait. Okay, I'll get that. This is what it looks like. <laughs> that's me down there in the red. Okay? And that's Little Saginaw Lake right beyond that, if you can get to it. Okay. I don't remember it being this hard. <laughs> okay. All right, so uh, those of you who plan to do the Frost River, um, my advice to you is, now that I'm older and wiser, be under, if you're going to, if you're going to follow the main body of the river, like the book says, be under 65. <laughs> or have some young bucks that can do the work for you. All right, now before we leave this, you might ask, some people will ask me, what have you, what have you been up to? Well, I guess what I decided, I wrote, I wrote another book. This one's going to be an e-book. It'll be on um, um, Kindle. It'll probably be on Kindle around June or so. It'll be on my website. I got I'm tired of seeing all these gray hairs in the boundary waters. Uh, how do I get young kids in? So I'm thinking, okay, if we, if young kids who love canoeing and camping, they're going to read about canoeing and camping. But there's a whole lot of young kids out there who've never been canoeing or camping, so they're never going to pick up a book out of it. So my thought was, supposing I write an adventure novel for 13 years, okay? And in that adventure novel, and this is what it, and in that adventure novel, okay, I, I, it's really a how-to book. And what actually, in this story, this is a story about a kid who's messing up in school and whose grandpa's this wilderness guru. And uh, they, so his, will, his grandpa agrees to take him on this long wilderness trip in Canada and straighten him out. And the school says, okay, if you bring him back and he takes good notes and pictures, whatever, we'll pass him in English and social studies. Well, it's, it's a long story. I want to tell it, tell it. But anyway, grandpa gets kidnapped along the way. And the kid has to continue 200 miles to the boat plant. So the only thing he has is he has this possible pack in this book, which his grandfather gave him. And the kid doesn't like to read, so he doesn't read books. And, uh, and this book contains everything you need to know about canoeing and camping. So he reads this book and figures out how to do it. And so it's really a how-to book, okay? So hopefully it will be out in June, and it won't be very expensive. And if you have a youngster that likes this sort of thing, they might enjoy it. Because my hope was that the story would keep them riveted while they would learn the how-to in the process. All right, enough of that. Uh, let's see if you would do that for me. And uh, let's, get, uh, let's get started here. All right, real quickly. Oh yeah, there's one other thing that I learned. In my book, Canoeing Wild Rivers, I repeatedly say, choose things that can be fixed with simple tools. 
Well, when we did the Frost River earlier this year, I had to decide which foam pad to take. I have two foam pads I, I really like a lot. One's an Nemo, okay, and the other one is an X-Pad. The Nemo is more comfortable than the X-Pad, but the Nemo requires 62, if I remember, 62 or 72 pushes to blow it up, okay? The X-Pad self-inflates and requires six breaths in itself. So I said, this is going to be a strenuous trip, I'm taking the X-Pad. Well, the x has twin valves, which I really like. All right, first night of the trip, blew a valve. It's an old mattress, okay, it blew a valve. What am I going to do? So I slept all night on the ground. You ever slept in the ground? Yeah. <laughs> so the next morning I wake up, and I'm going to fix this. And I, then I say, hey, it's got two valves. So I just, I just broke out the, the busted valve, filled the hole with a piece of wood, taped over it with duct tape, and then used the second valve to inflate and deflate. So it worked fine for the rest of the trip. So I guess these are these are things you may want to think about when you buy a, when you buy a foam pad or, or air pad or whatever. Be sure you have a backup. Okay, so that's that's just another thing I do. All right, quickly some handy things that I take on trips. With. I know these are little goofy things, but they're they're kind of handy. <clears throat> All right, everybody needs a digging tool of some sort. You can buy a fancy one, or you can cut off a lawn, piece of an old lawn chair, flatten it one end, and you have a digging tool. Then you can put a cork in one end, and you can put stuff inside. What's inside? Okay, next time you go to the dentist, the dentist throws these things away. They break, they throw them away. Ask him to save one for you. My dentist saved about 50 of them for me. Okay? And they're really handy for, like, if you have to work on a little stove, move, removing gaskets and things like that on, on stoves and tiny, small parts. Where if you've seen some of these little gasoline stoves today, they got all parts everywhere and they're difficult to handle. So I've used this a lot for stove maintenance. Okay, uh, some other things I bring. You know, um, <clears throat> my daughter, Clarissa, which is sitting right there, she came from Los Angeles, just to help her daddy. She hates canoeing and camping, <laughs> but she loves her dad. <laughs> Uh, anyway, she gave me these uh, a long time ago. You know, there's a sanding tool is sometimes really useful. There's been times on trips where I've broken a pole and I have to sand it flush and then pin it with a wood, wood pin or something like that. Sometimes, if you have a metal canoe, sometimes you can you can drop it on the ground. It creates a rust spot, and you, you need to, you need one to sand it off, or somebody can get hurt. Uh, or you have to fix something with fiberglass and then you need to sand, sand it down smooth at the end. So one of these is just the handy tool I find also. All right, some other handy things that I take along. Uh, I can't say enough good things, things about... Um, memory board. What? Can you name the items? You're saying this and we can't see it back here. So what is that thing that you are holding up? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Those were, they are officially called um, salon boards. <laughs> Thank you, I'm sorry. Okay. What was so the, the dentist item? What? The dentist item. What is it? What's the dentist? It's just those picks that they use on your teeth. Oh, yeah, you know the Thank thing you. that when the, the dentist gets in and he starts picking stuff out of your teeth? They, they use those for a while and then they, they break one of the tips off, so they throw them away. So they'll give them to you free because they just throw them in a can somewhere and then when they get enough of them, I don't know if they recycle them and throw them away or whatever. But I find them to be pretty handy for a lot of things. Thanks. Sorry about that. Hey, and hey, okay, I can't say enough good things about diaper pins. Diaper pins are really useful for a lot of things. Zipper pulls on jackets, zipper pulls on tents. If uh, something goes bad, you can hook it together with, with diaper pins. You don't need to buy fancy little clothes pins to hang up stuff in camp. Because all you do is you run a cord between two trees and you, you pin right through the cord, right through the, right through the center of the cord, and there's your clothes pin. So they're just a, that's a pretty, those are handy things. I carry a bunch of those. All right, some other handy things that I carry, you know, people are asking me about safety. Uh, yeah, you can bring a satellite phone if you want to. You can bring a spot or an increase. These technical things are all really nice. Okay, but if you want to bring any, if you want a cheap item, that you can bring an airplane down right now, this is it. This is called orange smoke. And you can get it at any marina. I think they're about $5 for one of these. And it works like a, a, a railroad plane. You just take the top off, snap it, 
and then it, and then it gets about a million cubic feet of orange smoke, which could, which can be seen about a hundred thousand miles. Okay, <laughs> and we have twice brought down airplanes with this when nothing else worked. Now I know there are people who think if you put five red canoes belly up on the edge of a lake, the plane will see it. You're wrong. Or if you have three or four brightly colored tents, the airplane will see it. Maybe, maybe not. But I'm going to tell you, they'll see smoke. And, 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 but as far as flares are concerned, forget flares. The only time you can really use a flare is at night. And they're not flying at night. And furthermore, you shoot off a flare in most northern canoe country, and you're going to have a forest fire in your hands. Okay? So this, is, and you can get these at any marina for about five bucks. So these are just some handy things that I take, okay? With those thoughts in mind, <clears throat> let's, here, here's the seven most important things I think we need to master if we want to be heroes to our friends. One, make a one-match fire in the rain. Two, storm-proof your cap, rig a rain tarp. Uh, my video, Forgotten Skills, shows that real clearly, I feel. How to sleep and work on a bad site. You know, the sites that you get are not always primo. So sometimes you're stuck with what you get and you've got to make the best of it. We'll look at that today. Uh, be a good navigator, don't get lost. Okay? Uh, prepare great meals without fuss. Okay? Hopefully we'll have some time to get to that. Um, it's not about recipes. If I, if I went into Martha Stewart's kitchen, I could make great meals. If I took her on a canoe trip, she'd be a disaster. And seriously. And that's because it's not about recipes. If you want recipes, ask mom. The only difference between an indoor meal and an outdoor meal, recipe-wise, is using dried milk and dried eggs versus the fresh thing. The recipes are the same. What you need are techniques, tips, tricks. Some of you may have my little cookbook and you understand what I'm saying. Trying to make a meal for six when it's howling bloody murder and raining and you've got a tiny little gasoline stove punching heat out like a blowtorch and you're trying to cook pasta on this thing and if you keep stirring, it never boils and if you quit stirring, you wind up with glue, not stew. That's called technique and those are the things you have to learn. People don't want to learn things. They want to buy something to fix it. All right. Waterproof your gear, make it bombproof. Okay, and then I would say, learn three quick release knots, okay? Which are, you know, I pay, I, like a lot of people, I have a knot book out there too. All right, and I suppose I probably, I have 80 knots in my knot book. But you, you don't need all those knots. You know how many knots you need? You need three. Okay, we could go four. If you're really a crazy wild outdoors person, you could maybe even add a fifth. Beyond that, I don't know, what are you using your knots for? Okay, this is the most important one, two half hitches. You use this for tying, tying your canoe to a tree, uh, tying up one end of a clothesline, anything you want to secure to the end of something. This is probably the most, this is a very useful knot. This is called the sheet bend. It came over with John Smith and the boys on the Mayflower. It's called the sheet bend because at the main sheet or sail on the boat, at the main, the main sheet line holding the sail, Tore, you were in big trouble. Okay, so this was the only knot that you could put hold, put it back together again with that would not slip. And this will work even if you got slippery polypropylene line. It's a very simple knot, but it must be done exactly as shown. You can end it with a quick release like you do here, and this is great because if you put up rain flies or something in camp and, and you, the cord's too short to reach a tree and you've got a daisy chain out there, you add it, you add these things with quick release sheet beds. Blink, 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 as long as you go. So this is the second, this is the second one. Okay, and this is the third one. This, I, I never knew the name of this, I named it a power cinch. It, I learned later that its real name is a trucker's hitch. It is actually a pulley knot. In fact, it's kind of a rendition of the Z drag that they use for canoe rescue because it allows you to provide force this way while exerting force this way. It's really pretty cool. Those of you who are still using a taut line hitch to set up a tent, you need to throw, over, throw away those 1920 Boy Scout books and get with the new program. The old taut line hitch was great when you had canvas tents that shrunk when it rained. Tents don't shrink when it rains. They expand when it rains. They're all nylon today. Hello? Yeah. Nylon. 
Okay, this is the best hit shed I can, we use this all the time. You want to put up a clothesline in camp, that's the hitch. You want to tie a canoe on your car, that's the hitch. A lot of people use straps to put a canoe on their car, that's probably because they don't know how to use a hitch. The advantage of using this over straps on a car is they're not going to steal your ropes, but they will steal your um, straps. Which means you got to take the straps and put them in the car every time you do this, and then you got to take them all out, wind them up. But you'll see most of your top canoeists to canoe all the time just use ropes, and they take the canoe and they just leave the ropes hanging because they know nobody's going to steal them. And you can throw a rope over a car, and it's not going to have a buckle that's going to hit the car on the other end. So there's some advantage. Yes? You don't show the end though. You've got to have a, when you're all done pulling that tight, you've got to put a sheet Yeah, doesn't it show it on here? Oh, you're right. And what was the name of it again? Uh, you're right. Or maybe, well, or maybe it just didn't pick up the bottom picture. You're right. It just didn't. You're right. And what you do is you just thank you. Actually, what you do here, this just closes around here with a couple of half inches. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. This, this, this you'll just you'll get this where you want, then you'll close it with a couple of half inches going up. Colin, you guys, this is Sunday morning. You guys are really on top of this. Holy cow. All right. Great. Okay. So, all right, real quickly, right now, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about stormproofing your tent. I, I, I'm, really not, I'm not trying to do a plug for this video, but the video has 90 minutes on this stuff, and on the tent alone, it's got a half an hour. And uh, I, so I can't spend a lot of time on this, but I just want to share with you just a few things about picking a tent and setting it up. And I want you to bear in mind that um, American manufacturers are, Americans are into cutesy stuff, okay? And, and things like plastic windows in the tents, I think, see now tents even have some electricity with LED lights in them. Now, I mean, here's, here's, here's the thing. What you want in a tent is you want about three things. You want absolutely waterproof and bunkproof. Okay? Number two, you want fast setup. Number three, you also want not just fast setup, but you want dry setup in the rain. Now you don't accomplish that if the tent has a separate rain fly. In other words, if the tent has a separate rain fly, while you're putting up the canopy, the tent's getting soaked and wet. Then you put the fly up. Good news, it's already soaked. Now if you contrast that difference with the best European tents, you'll see that none of the European tents have separate flies. They all have integral flies. The flies can be removed, but it's a bit of a time-consuming deal. Okay? Now, manufacturers tell you that they do the separate flies for a reason. You can pitch a tent without a fly in the desert, and yeah, it's cooler. I've done a fair amount of desert camping now. You know what? It gets down to freezing, below freezing at night in the desert, like 10, 15 to 20 degrees along the Rio Grande in January. Okay? So, no, I'm not going to leave my fly. Plus, the sun will kill you, so you really need the fly for the sun. They will tell you they use, they use, most American tents have what's called a cap fly, which means it doesn't stay completely to the ground. There's an airspace. Now, manufacturers will tell you that airspace is there for a reason. It allows good ventilation. You know what it does? I'll tell you what it does. It saves this much fabric, that long, whatever, on both sides of the tent. Now, if you want to cut weight in bulk in a tent, there's two ways that you can do it. One is to use thinner, cheaper, crummier poles, and the other is to eliminate some fabric. So one, you eliminate this fabric all the way around, and you probably save maybe four ounces. But every year, Backpacker does its annual issue of whatever editor's choice, and people pick it up, and it says, this tent weighs four pounds, six ounces. This one weighs four pounds, four ounces. Wow, I'm buying this one. It's that tight in marketing. So if you want to save weight, you, 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 you cut some fabric, you use cheaper poles, and you try to get away with as few stakes as possible. Because each stake weighs what? An ounce? Okay? So if you knock off four stakes, that's four ounces. And then what you're going to do is you're going to supply the crummiest, stupidest stakes possible. 
church. Okay? Little tiny ones about this long because they're the lightest you can go. And when they weigh the package for the annual backpacker award, yours comes in lightest. I'm not making this up. All right, so what I'm going to say to you, I'm just going to do a few things because I don't have time to go into this. Set up the tent and pretend your hands are water. Okay? Run down the fly all the way around. Your, your, hand, the, your hand should fall on the floor. If it doesn't touch the floor, you've got a problem. Now, a lot, a lot of these, this tent has what is called a bathtub floor. It rolls up the sides, okay? That's because it's an A-frame, and you can do that. So the first seam is way up here. So there's no seams in touch with the ground. That's a good idea, okay? But if you have a dome-style tent, you cannot have a bathtub floor because the floor design is like that, six-sided, eight-sided, whatever they use. And that has to be sewn at ground level. So all these seams now are at ground level. And a lot of times, the fly, most of the time, the fly does not cover those seams. Water will fall all right on those seams. But you say, come on, all these seams are factory sealed. Yeah, they are. They use a, seal, a seam taping machine to seal all this. Now, that's fine. If you're only going to use your tent a week a year for the next seven or eight years and then buy another, that's what the manufacturer banks on. But if you're going to hammer it, like I do, what's going to happen is these seams are always in contact with the, with the ground, okay, and they're getting grit in them and everything, and it gets hot, it gets cold, the seam tape starts coming loose and different, and pretty soon you have water coming in. And when it rains, the water's going to go right on the seam. And there's nothing you can do about it except a, except live with it. Okay? So make sure my advice to you is make sure it covers every every single seam and every single stitch. And look what you can do, see what you can do to stormproof the tent. Okay, I'm going to go over to this side over here. And when this side of the tent is pulled out, if I get a strong wind coming in this way, it's going to push this side wall in. If it pushes that in, it's going to touch the inner canopy, you're going to get condensation, and you're going to get wet. So I just added a little loop like this. And then I would tie on to this with a sheet bin, run it out to a tree. Yeah, I'd like to strive for high C, just enough to keep this thing from blowing in and collapsing. Yeah, you're, and then I would also, now I've also added a bunch of other little wires out here on the tent, the sides, okay? This is the tent came with this. Tent came with this, it did not come with this, and I added it. So I'm, I'm adding some storm rooms all around. I'm also adding storm, a storm loop in the center here. So when I've added a storm loop, what I have here is I have a little Velcro tab on the back of this, and the Velcro tab will tab around the pole. So when I pull on this, I'm actually pulling on the pole and not on fabric. Does this make sense? Now this works perfectly with a dome with all these poles, okay? So you can sew a tab on there, put a Velcro tab around the inside to the poles. Now you're pulling from the poles and the dome will go down. But this is stuff you have to do yourself. Um, uh, I'm sure some, like I said, some of you guys might have like, okay, we can't be stuff. Secrets or boundary waters and, uh, and it's in there. Uh, that goes through the whole, through the whole, um, the whole stone through the process. The question then becomes, why don't manufacturers put these storms in? I'll tell you why. Because they think you're stupid. <laughs> Honest. They think you cannot be educated. They think the public doesn't care. They think the public doesn't know. I fight this constantly. I say, Alex Tilly was the smart one. He invented a hat with an eight-page user manual. Why don't you have a user manual for this? Because what happens is if you put all these storm caps on here, and the average person takes that tent out of the bag, and they see there are six stakes in there, they look, there's 28 State points. What? I need 28 states to set this tent up, and they're on the phone. Why did, if I need that, if I had to have this many states, why didn't you send me them? And it becomes a, a nightmare. What would be much simpler if they had a hang tag on there that told about the tent, we have extra storm tabs for you. In case you need them, use them. However, under normal conditions, you only need these four. Okay? But no, they don't think you will read them. I think you will, and I think that's why you are here today. By the way, you were, you were amazing to be here today, because there aren't a lot of people like you left who do this. And I say this from the heart, because they don't want to learn something. They want to buy something. 
If they're getting rocks with their canoe, they need a tougher canoe. If they're getting wet in their tent at night, they need a better tent. God. You know what, I, 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 I don't have much more time to go into the tent, except the rules are, when possible, when you add lines to this thing, always attach the exoskeleton if you can. For example, oh, how, what happened? You were sitting on the Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not doing well this morning. All right. For example, this stand over here has a little D-ring at the top that you're supposed to, in a, in a, in a wind, you're supposed to attach a cord to that, okay? And you run the cord down here. Well, the first thing that's going to happen, I'm going to rip off the D-ring. In the meantime, the cord's going to run right down here and bring the, the fabric. Well, what I've done here is I've attached this right to the exoskeleton inside, twin lines, run twin lines out. So now, one line's good, two lines are better. Two stakes are better than one stakes. And now we're double stake. And if it's in mud and rain, guess what? I would use two stakes on each line. Two stakes here and two stakes there. It's four stakes. That thing will come out. Which means not only when you, you choose your tent, <coughs> it means if the tent comes with six stakes, basically you want to carry about 10 or 12. All right? So you're going to have enough to read your storm lines. Okay. Now, with these thoughts in mind, let's see. Um, <coughs> Okay, excuse me, one second. How did I get to that? <laughs> oh, well, how did I get way over there? <laughs> All right. This is crazy. All right. Now, the best tip, those of you guys who heard me speak before or read my books, you know I had this thing about putting the ground cloth inside the tent. Not never underneath the floor. I won't give an inch on this. Anybody want to do war over it? We'll do war over it. I've been there, done that, put it under the tent, doesn't work. All right, now this particular picture, this is actually from the Boundary Waters Canoe Area. This is Ham Lake, believe it or not. This is a big storm. Can you see this okay? Do we need to drop the lights a little bit? Huh? Maybe just drop the lights a little bit. Okay. All right, and it rained. I can't, I don't know how much it rained, but it's all I know is this is what this tent looked like literally one hour later. It's flooded. Now, maybe you've never had this experience. Well, you're lucky. Keep canoeing and camping, and someday you will. Okay? And what's going to happen is your entire tent is going to get flooded. You won't have a choice. And a lot of times you're camp, you, have, you come into a campsite, especially in, you know, in, in many places, and here's a beautiful spot to pitch a tent. But there's a rock face that goes like this, and there's a rock face that goes like this. And you know if it rains, you're swimming. The alternative is you can go up on this hill over there, which is a boulder guard. So you just look at this, and well, say, ah, it looks okay, I'm camping down here. And then it rains. Then you, and I don't care what kind of tent you had, they're gonna be flooded. So you, you wanna have a ground cloth in your tent, you wanna make the ground cloth a foot larger than the tent all around. So that it rolls up the side walls a bit, like you see here. Right. Now, when the tent becomes flooded, here, this one is, you will stay dry. Now, my wife said don't tell stories because we always run out of time. Ten minutes! <laughs> We're not going to get anywhere today. Well, <laughs> uh, you know what, I'm just going to do what we can do in ten minutes. She says don't tell stories, but you know, this one, this is such an important thing. Um, some years ago, a plane dropped us off in, in northern Manitoba on a river in a swamp. Had to do it because that's the only place he could land. He said it come be back in two hours. Okay, guess what? Starts raining, starts blowing bloody murder, waves four feet high. We had to camp two nights in a swamp because the plane couldn't come back with the second half of the crew. And I remember standing there and water literally running over my shoes. And then it would stop. And that's what, when you climbed inside the tent, it was like a water bath. If we hadn't had those plastic ground sheets in there, we'd have died. And by the way, it's, you're not going to save your tent floor by putting the plastic under the floor because holes develop from the inside. They're called green stick breaks. In other words, if you take a green stick and you bend it like this, it elongates on the top until it snaps every time, right? That's what happens when a, a pin or something tries to come through your tent floor. The coating, the waterproof coating is on the inside. So the, the, the object pushes up and pushes up and stretches the coating and stretches the coating, so the coating always breaks first. 
So by putting an extra layer on the inside, it just makes it harder to break through the coating. I have these old tents, literally, that I've used for 30 years in commercial outfitting. They ultimately die because the water will rain and go right through the fly, but there's no holes in the floor. They were used all over the boundary waters, the high Arctic, western Canada, and you name it. All right, um, a, a word or two about stakes. We're not going to get very far today, but we'll try. Um, you want to, I'm always on the lookout for good tent stakes. Um, the ones that are supplied with your tent are usually very, very basic and, and the cheapest, lightest stakes that they can find. These are some different kinds of stakes. Uh, these are my favorites right here. These are 12 inch long aluminum arrow shaft stakes. And these are great in any kind of soft ground, sand, whatever, swamp, you need. But they also are great if you're going to do like a, a northern Canadian river and you're going to camp down gravel bars with fist sized gravel. You can take the back end of a hand axe and you can pound these babies right in. They are just tough as nails. This is the major stake I use all the time. Yes, they are expensive. They're a couple of bucks a piece. Okay? All right, now these babies over here, these are just your, this is your normal bound water steak right here. And these are you pound them tri-corner steaks. And sometimes a few you pound them steaks are useful, depending on what you're camping on that night. Okay? But the point, but the two things are on steaks. One, get long steaks. Personally, I like steaks that are at least 10 inches long. I like 10 to 12 inch long steaks myself. To me, anything much shorter than 8 inches may not be enough. But, uh, and bring a variety of steaks because you don't know what your campsite's going to be like that night and what's a good steak for one side's a bad one for another. And bring a bunch of cord. This is about uh, 200 feet of parachute cord, all wrapped up in 20 foot sections. So I can daisy chain them together uh, as I need to. Uh, where are we with this now? Let's just see. Let's see what we can do. Okay. Um, you need to stake your tent down. Um, this, is a, this is a tent that supposedly needs no stake. I remember, this was on the English River in Ontario, and I remember, I remember chasing that one down the lake. It wasn't mine. Okay. And so many times you are camped in a site where it's terrible. And you just in, in your cockeyed and things aren't right. Sometimes you have to sleep on an incline. I know all the all the literature says when you pitch your tent, pitch it with the head uphill. I disagree. I think this is a smarter way to pitch a tent. I think your if you pitch a tent uphill, then what actually happens is your head's here, your feet here, and you slide downhill all night. But if you pitch it sideways, and then you take all your spare clothes, you do have spare clothes, and then you jack, sit that underneath your sleeping pad on one side, just jack it up, okay? And so now what happens is you're sleeping sideways, but you're sleeping on the level. Does that make sense? Okay, well, that's what I do. Uh, anyway, okay, uh, let's see what else. Do, what else? Um, cover your sleeping pad. Um, you know, you buy one of these sleeping pads of pla plastic on both sides, right? Not very comfortable. Most of the time in the summer, you're sleeping, it's so hot. Five, he says. Five, thank you. Okay, five. Okay. Most of the time in the summer, you're sleeping with your bare back against the pad. That's not very comfortable. It's hot. And then if it gets cold, you just sort of use your sleeping bag as a cover. Anybody do that? Yeah. Okay, so why not just cover your sleeping bag just as a light cotton, I don't know, cotton flannel sheet, just sewn up one side. Once you cover your bed, now it's luxurious. I mean, the last time I slept on plastic, I was three years old, okay? So, so you know, cover, cover your sleeping bag, it will be night, it will absorb the sweat from sleeping, it will keep your pad from sliding around in the tent, it will keep the pad from getting holes in it, and when it gets to the end of the trip, you just wash the cover and everything's clean again. Now, manufacturers have tried, both Nemo and Expat have come out with, with covers like this, but they've always been fairly expensive and not in stores, and I don't think most consumers really understand or appreciate the value of the cover. They look at it as, oh, that's another three ounces, I don't think I need that. Listen, it's three ounces of delightful wonder. <laughs> All right, let's see very quickly what else. Cover your sleeping pad. Break a folding stool. Um, you know, there's all kinds of stools. I've tried all kinds out there, but this is my favorite. No, it's not as comfortable as some of the high-tech ones, but here's where it excels. 
You're walking along on the porridge, and you're so tired, you set off the pack, you, you, now you can go sit on that wet log. Or you can unsnap this right here, just give it a quick unsnap, open it up, and you can sit down. Or you're going down the river, and it's lunchtime. You just stop along the shore, it's going to do a quick break, you want to get out of the canoe, and you want to stretch a little bit, you can stick this, you can stick this chair right in, the, right in the river and sit on it and keep your feet cool while you're eating, while you're eating lunch. And then you can just close the thing up. The, the problem with the, the high-tech chairs is you have to put them together, which means they're great, they're great once you get in camp, but you can't use them along the way during the day while you're camping. So that's why I much prefer this system here. All right. Finally, and we'll end with this because we don't have time. You know, we said earlier, <coughs> excuse me, making food is about, <coughs> sorry, making food is about technique. And the best way to do this is to don't follow the manufacturer's directions. Okay? In other words, if you're going to make oatmeal for four, put the water in the pot, okay? C cover the pot with a cozy system, okay? In other words, I have some cozies here. I probably don't have time to drag them out and show you because we're way, whoops, we're, we're just way, way behind on. This is just a cat made out of a fabric, all right? It's like putting your hat on it. Or you just, just bring the, take the pot, cover it with a, with a fabric with like a, your, your jacket or whatever you need. You don't want to use your jacket because it's on a stove. So you make a fitted cozy, like a tea cozy, like mom had on a teapot. And that brings, brings it to temperature very, very quickly. As soon as it gets hot, you throw the oatmeal in there, you take the thing off, and then you take the whole pot off, you set it on a closed cell phone pad, cover it all up, walk away for 20 minutes, and it's done. And you have stew and not glue. And unfortunately, we're out of time. I just don't know where the time flies. You guys are such an interesting audience. I don't know where the time flies. I don't know where it goes. But hey, uh, listen, we, uh, I'll be back. Uh, I'll be back at the what you call it place and uh, the book place. And give me ten minutes, and we can talk about stuff. Thank you so much for being such a great.